We're going to look at return to play. This is our last dot point for how is injury rehabilitation managed and also our last dot point for sports med. So our syllabus for return to play is quite long, so we need to have a look at the indicators to find out when an athlete is actually ready to return to play. We have to look at how our progress is monitored, uh, whether the athlete is psychologically ready to return uh, to the field. We have to look at specific warm-up procedures that might be given to the athlete, uh, return, to uh, return to play policies and procedures, and also the ethical considerations that are involved uh, in an athlete returning to play. Our Learn 2 says that you guys need to research and evaluate uh, skill and other physical tests that could be used to indicate whether or not an athlete is ready to return to play. Uh, and you also need to critically examine uh, the policies and procedures that regulate the timing of return to play. And uh, there's a whole bunch of questions here you have to consider, uh, such as why aren't policies applied to all sports? Uh, who should actually have the ultimate responsibility for deciding if an athlete should return to play? Uh, and then also thinking about whether or not uh, painkillers should be used at all uh, in returning to play from an injury. Indicators for readiness to return to play are essentially that the athlete is pain-free and that they have a good degree of mobility. So pain-free uh, is specific to the sport, so it's not just mean that the athlete can walk around the house. Okay, If an athlete sprained their ankle, they need to go through a whole bunch of fitness tests and everything, and they need to be pain-free in those tests. They should be involved in some mini-games and stuff uh, for their sport, again, making sure that they're pain-free. So. Uh, as rehabilitation progresses, generally athletes will start to return uh, to normal training and then into um, some trial games or something or lower level games um, or even just some training games. Uh, and during those games, uh, you want to make sure that that athlete is pain-free the whole way through as they progress in intensity and duration and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's partly why athletes are returned you know, as a sub, so they get a piece of time at the right intensity and they need to make sure it's pain free and they'll slowly get reintroduced to the game because it's about making sure the athlete uh, doesn't have pain again, doesn't uh, re-injure uh, their injury, they actually want to make sure they're looking after them. And the degree of mobility, again you want to make sure that that's returning to what it used to be or possibly even better. So if an athlete has um, strained their hamstring for example, you want to make sure that they can get full flexibility uh, through their hip and knees and making sure that uh, that's pain-free mobility and that they can swing it the whole way through. Uh, again, uh, that kind of is going to be context-specific. So, you know, if they're a swimmer, uh, then the degree of mobility uh, still needs to be important, but not quite as important as it might be for an AFL player, for example, uh, who has to swing their leg the whole way through as they kick and needs to sprint at really high intensities. That's not to say that swimming doesn't involve uh, the hamstring, but not... Uh, to the same degree that AFL does. And so when an athlete is ready to return for either of those sports might be slightly different. But at the same time, however, uh, they're going to go through indicators to make sure that they are pain-free and have proper mobility for their sport before they go back to it. As always with rehabilitation, you want to make sure that you're monitoring progress. So this involves pre- and post-injury testing, but also testing throughout the um, the rehabilitation process. So uh, testing generally will involve all the different components of fitness. You're not just going to test um, their muscular strength of their hamstring, which happens to be the thing that was injured. You want to make sure that you're actually testing all the different components across the whole body. Um, obviously, you want to make sure you're also targeting uh, the areas around that injury to make sure it's capable of uh, maintaining and dealing with uh, the stress that's involved uh, in those tests. Those tests should be sport specific. So uh, particularly important for netball, for example, would be a lot of agility testing. Uh, whereas if it's someone who is involved uh, in a 100 meter sprint, agility is really not needed for that. However, you do want to make sure you're uh, doing plenty of testing on power and speed uh, for the sprinter, um, which will also be something relevant for netball, but ne not necessarily as relevant for someone who does lawn bowls or something like that. Uh, you also want to make sure that your pre and post injury testing is specific to your injury. Uh, so not only will you do kind of general things for the whole body, you also want to make sure that you're really putting that injured section through the rings, making sure that it's really up to uh, scratch and ready to return to play. So uh, that's going to mean that if it's an, a damaged ankle, you're going to put it through plenty of agility testing, plenty of power and uh, speed testing, but those tests are going to involve uh, the feet, the ankles, uh, the knees and the legs. You're going to make sure you're putting that athlete through movements that involve the section uh, that used to be injured. 
You then want to have a think about whether or not the athlete is psychologically ready. So it's one thing to be ready physically. It's another thing to be ready psychologically. Uh, so when you are injured, particularly if you're injured for a long period of time, uh, athletes tend to get a bit worried if they've had a big injury such as um, you know, if they're completely torn or ruptured an ACL, had to undergo knee reconstructive surgery and stuff like that. Uh, those athletes tend to be a bit anxious when they come back to performance because uh, they're worried that they're going to do it again. They're not entirely sure that their ACL is as strong as the doctor or the health professionals are telling them. And uh, if they are anxious and they get returned to play, uh, even though they're physically ready, they're going to start to shield uh, their injured area. They're not going to go into uh, their performances at 100% because they're going to hold back a bit to protect uh, their injury. And that then leads to poor technique uh, and it makes them more likely to get injured. So if you think of uh, someone who plays uh, rugby league, for example, who's returning uh, from uh, shoulder surgery, uh, such an athlete, if they shield that shoulder, they're going to keep trying to use their other shoulder, which will mean that they end up putting their head in a bad position and could get concussed. Um, it could also mean that they use a poor technique in their tackling, uh, which means they're more likely to get injured. But it also may just mean that they're not confident when they go in for the tackle and they're not going to go in at 100%, in, and which means that the athlete that they're trying to tackle is then actually going to uh, possibly damage them because they're not going in confident, they're not going in at 100% to make that tackle. They're less likely to make the tackle, but they're also more likely to get injured as a result of that. Uh, on the flip side, however, uh, there are other athletes who are overconfident uh, as they return to play, and they're probably the ones who are more dangerous because those athletes, they want to return, they're anxious to return, as you know, most athletes are because most athletes are you know, super motivated uh, and really want to achieve stuff. And so uh, that overconfidence in their injury then leads them to returning before they're actually physically ready. Uh, they might actually start to hide the fact that they're not pain-free uh, when they're doing, when they're going through their motion, uh, and they're trying to hide it or shield it from the um, professionals who are assessing them and stuff. And so, if they go back too early, and then go, they're a lot more likely to re-injure themselves. So, uh, often psychological strategies are used to help athletes as they deal with this. Uh, so that can be things like meditation, just focusing activities, uh, things that get them to. Um, you know, visualize uh, performing the technique and the skills uh, just to really help them to develop their confidence. Uh, often during this time too, if a coach gives plenty of positive feedback, that can be really beneficial for our athlete. Often athletes will also be given specific warm-up procedures to go along uh, with their normal warm-up. So this is in addition to a normal warm-up. So the athlete will still go out and do a normal warm-up and then afterwards they might have a few specific exercises or movements or a few extra stretches uh, that their physio uh, wants them to do and so they'll do those things as a specific warm-up just for them to make sure that that um, injured section is less likely to get injured. Uh, so for a hamstring strain for example that might mean a few more dynamic stretches, it might mean a few conditioning activities that really focus on the hamstrings. Um, it can also include things like massage so they might actually get um, a sports massage of that hamstring before they go out and do their normal warm-up and then have a few more specific activities such as dynamic stretching uh, to develop um, and make sure that their hamstring is ready uh, for them to go into uh, performance. So the specific warm-ups, they're, they're going to target the injured area uh, and they're also going to start to more replicate competition demands to make sure that that hamstring is um, all that injury, whatever area is injured, is really ready to return to play and is ready to enter into that competition and is less likely to get re-injured. Return to play policies and procedures. Now, often these policies and procedures are developed along with uh, professional organisations such as uh, the Sports Medicine Australia. So these kinds of organisations uh, develop a lot of policies and procedures and guidelines and stuff that are then given to professional associations uh, to use um, and to adjust in terms of how they're applied for their sport. So uh, examples of these are the concussion policies. So often discussion, uh, often the concussion policies are used uh, as examples within PDHPE. So uh, generally speaking, throughout uh, Football Federation Australia, uh, the Rugby League or ARL and AFL, 
Uh, they tend to all actually use the same concussion policy, which is developed by Sports Medicine Australia. Uh, they slightly modify it, but generally speaking, all those sports have exactly the same concussion policy. Uh, however, if you then look at combat sports, they have a very different um, concussion policy. And generally that's because they're more likely to um, suffer re-injury of a concussion in those sports, uh, particularly in a sport like boxing where uh, people are getting hit in the head frequently. Uh, someone who gets knocked out or suffers a concussion, uh, they have different rules for them because they're a lot more likely when they re-enter that ring or even re-enter training that they're going to suffer another concussion, particularly if the concussion hasn't fully recovered. Uh, and so we have different policies for um, for boxing compared to the policies that exist for FFA, Rugby League or the AFL. When it comes to return to play, plenty of ethical things that people need to consider. Uh, one of the main ethical things is the pressure that's on athletes to return to play. So whether that be an elite athlete or a novice, there's always some kind of pressure. It can be your mates putting pressure on you to come back because they're starting to lose. Uh, it can be, if you're an elite athlete, the money that people are paying, the expectations that are upon you. So you think if someone like Cristiano Ronaldo uh, is injured, the pressure that's on him to return uh, is a lot larger than it would be on someone who doesn't have his same um, exposure, his same uh, marketing prowess, uh, the same amount of money going into him and also the, same, the money that comes out of him um, because him being at the club brings in a lot of money. And so there becomes a lot of pressure for him to return early, uh, which then means that he's more likely to return when he's not ready and actually suffer a re-injury. Um, it can be really um, unethical, particularly if it's someone uh, like the coach or people who actually have financial interests putting pressure on the athlete to return. Uh, it's unethical because they're interested in their money or in achieving uh, the winning, um, winning the season, uh, maintaining their reputation or whatever, uh, and they're placing pressure on the athlete to return too early. Uh, and coaches sometimes are people who are involved in the decision making uh, of when an athlete can return and that makes it really uh, unethical for them to be involved in that. Uh, there's also internal pressures from the athletes, so you know expectations of themselves, their motivation, their drive, uh, knowing that their fitness levels are going down and they're going to have to redo all their fitness training to get themselves back up to the, where they were at before they suffered their injury. Uh, all that kind of stuff becomes um, an internal pressure on this athlete to return to play. Uh, and so they might decide that they need to return uh, and it will be too early and they're going to re-injure themselves. The other ethical consideration is the use of painkillers. So it's really important to know that pain is, is good for the athlete. Pain uh, is when your body tells you that something is wrong, something's been damaged, and that you need to change your movement to avoid causing further damage. So when you cover that up, that means that you're more likely to cause further damage to your body uh, because you can't feel that something is wrong. Uh, now, whether this is ethical or unethical will often depend on the type of drug, uh, who's giving it, what the situation, the context is around it. Uh, so when it comes to the type of drug, for example, an athlete who might take two Panadol to relieve um, the pain from a muscle cramp, that generally is considered fairly ethical because it's not a, um, a very strong drug and it also is not a major um, injury, so to speak, uh, with the athletes uh, for them to be able to continue to play. However, if they're going to take something like codeine or methadine to cover um, you know, a level 2 sprain of their hamstring, uh, that's pretty much guaranteed to end up in a ruptured hamstring uh, if the athlete is not very careful. And so it's very important in that context that they actually don't take the painkiller uh, because they are going to cause further damage and that further damage can be actually really uh, debilitating and result in surgery and uh, months off from the sport. Uh, so in terms of the context there, you know, if the athlete is already going to be having months off the sport and uh, it's their last game or something for the rest of uh, their career, they're ending it and they get an injury, then they may choose to continue and take the drugs and go, it's okay because I've got plenty of time to recover. I'm not going to be playing this sport again, uh, not at least not at this level. And so uh, they may decide that it is okay. But still you have to think about the ethical considerations in terms of the safety and promoting the well-being of that athlete. Now, you're required to critically examine the policies and procedures that regulate the timing of return to play. And when you do that critical examination, uh, there's a list of questions that you're meant to consider. So some of those questions are listed here. So one of them, why aren't policies applied to all sports? 
at a basic level, they're not blanketly applied to all sports because all sports are different. Okay, so you'll notice that a lot of sports that are generally quite similar will actually use a very similar policy or procedure. But then when you transfer from um, sports, like in our example beforehand, you know, soccer, rugby league, AFL, they're kind of similar sports and so they use a similar concussion policy. But then when you transfer into the combat sport, they need to change that policy. They need to make sure that the athlete is really being looked after, that we're promoting the well-being of that athlete. And so they change the policy and make sure that it suits their context. Okay, and so they're not blanketly applied because you don't want to have your soccer player out for a whole month or more uh, because they've suffered a concussion. You, you do want them to be looked after uh, and you do want them to not return until a doctor or something has given approval. One of the other questions that you have to ask is who should ultimately decide? Uh, should it be the athlete? Should it be the coaches? Should it be the medical staff? Um, within that question, it's really hard because you want to kind of say that the athlete should be the one who makes that decision, but really the athlete's not qualified to make that decision. Uh, they might know their body and know whether or not they're in pain or not, um, but they don't actually know uh, the details around rehabilitation. They don't know a lot of medical information about injuries and how long they take. Uh, they don't know how to read and interpret x-rays or MRIs or anything like that to actually know whether or not the injury has fully recovered. And so it's important when it comes to the decision that it's actually about um, fully informing the athlete and other people are being involved. And that's why normally our policies and procedures will say that the athlete um, can't go back until they're approved by a medical professional, approved by um, another type of professional, such as a physio or something, they often will have to show um, some scans to show that they're ready to return, and also they'll have to pass fitness tests and stuff. And so they, there's lots of uh, policies and procedures there that make sure that they're actually safe and ready to return to play before they get in there. And then, of course, the painkillers. Uh, painkillers, very contextual. Uh, what painkiller are we talking about? Panadol, uh, morphine, uh, or anything like that. Very different uh, in terms of whether or not they should be used or not. Uh, and they, what they actually do to the athlete's body in terms of covering pain, how much pain they'll cover, etc. Uh, so you need to think about uh, the entire context with painkillers. Generally speaking, you don't want to be putting the athlete at um, further risk of injury. Um, you want to be considering their safety and their well-being. Yeah.